With the new PDX Con, we got notification of Victoria 3 coming out here probably in the next year or so. And in this video today, I want to discuss two of the big things that Paradox has gone over with the Viconomics, the new economic system for, or at least the teaser for the economic system for Victoria 3, the art of Victoria, as well as the possible campaign map and how that's going to be playing out when we see the game. And I'll be closing the video out talking about some speculation as to when that release date might be. B. I'll be starting the video out initially, though, with just a real quick kind of historical primer as to what the Victorian era really is. Um, but this will give you at least a bit of a perspective. Now, being totally honest with you guys and 100% upfront, I have not played Victoria 2. So that will be a big project of mine this summer is playing Victoria 2 to really understand it before coming into Victoria 3 and also covering a lot of the news developments as they come out for you guys. If you want a, I'd say, a better perspective on how some of the new mechanics are influenced or how they're changed from Victoria 2, please go and check out One Proud Bavarian. He's been doing an amazing job of covering everything from the PDX Con all the way up to the uh, Victoria 3 coverage that Paradox has been doing. So please go and check his channel out for some, I guess, kind of a juxtaposition between Victoria 2 to Victoria 3. But let's get started here on all the goods that have come out with Victoria 3, starting with some history. So to give you a quick crash course on the Victorian era, it starts, um, the common misconception is that it starts at 1837 with the rise of Queen Victoria in Britain. It actually starts really around 1820, and it lasts to roughly around 1901 with Queen Victoria's death. And really you're kind of looking at this period from 1814, 1815 up to 1914, 1915, which is seen essentially as the British century. And even though it's called the Victorian era, it does have a lot of geopolitical connotations across almost everything in the world. And you see a map here of 1837, right? This is what the world looked like at the time. Everything in red is the British empire. And as the century kind of drones on, you get a lot of really big conventions, right? You get the Industrial Revolution, you get the invention of the telegraph, of the telephone, of all of these really big things that kind of jettison humanity quite a few steps forward in its technological understanding, everything, I guess you want to say. And what's really important about this era is how Britain was really viewed, right? This was this very large um, international empire in a lot of ways that other empires couldn't compete with anymore. Uh, the Russian Empire was still huge, right? It still owned portions of Alaska and Western portions of Canada. You still had uh, France having quite a big colonial um, occupation across the globe. So, uh, but nothing really compared to the British Empire. And the Victorian era is where you get that, well, I do say good chap, like that really quintessential look. I mean, this is what Charles Dickens and uh, Charles Darwin Darwin. This is when they are out and about doing their thing. This is where we get a lot of the, I guess you could say, established morality of the Victorian era, right? Where the, the man goes out into the outside world, the woman stays at home, the woman will show no revealing anything, and the man will also dress just as humble. And at the same time, a woman will never be seen outside of the home unless it is with a man. A lot of these... Um, value systems that go on to color the next century or so and the victorian era when we kind of look at that end of queen victoria when she when she passes away in 1901 um, we see britain at its height and britain has fully expanded here you can see here is a map of 1901 it is fully expanded now to encompass western canada it's purchased that mainly from what from uh, russia i believe um, africa it's expanded into egypt into the sudan into the kenya and into portions of somalia in the northern portion of africa then moving into the southern portion of africa you get south africa you get botswana zimbabwe uh, zambia southern portions of the congo then on the west ghana and nigeria so british empire had really expanded everywhere right even into more portions of Asia with Burma, Singapore, uh, Brunei, Papua New Guinea, or Solomon Islands, New Zealand. So this sets the stage for what Victoria III will encompass. And it will be in this era of a lot of technological boon, but also stability. This is not the moving borders of um, 
Imperator Rome. It is not the moving borders of Crusader Kings 3. It is dealing with a lot of quote unquote building tall and dealing with a lot of the geopolitical boundaries that exist outside of your actual territorial boundaries. So it's a bit different of a game from what I understand, what I've seen and what, I, what I've gathered now, but I'm really excited to jump into it when the game is fully launched. But moving into the economics, the economics portion, as it were, and I, I apologize if I got any of that history a little wrong. I am but an American, and during that time period, we were having civil wars and expanding into the new frontier and getting a wild, wild west going on. Will Smith was all over the place and the Trail of Tears. So for us, not a great time in our, in our history, but let's move in here into the economics to talk about some of the slides that we got from the PDX con. Now... Let's talk a little bit about scale. So we have 1 billion people at the start of the game, 750 plus states belonging to 140 plus markets. Now markets are important. Um, and again, I've, I've done enough kind of base research in, to know in Victoria that markets are essentially the means to which you can be making money within your, um, not faction, but within your nation. So these markets are important and growing markets and, and growing in those markets is the key to making more money. Uh, 5 million pounds, a uh, million GDP at game start, most of it in the private sector, 50 some odd building types and 50 some odd goods types. Now this will be updated because they've said they're not quite in the beta phase yet. This is just in the alpha phase. Um, they haven't hit uh, that, that kind of critical testing point. They're still moving a lot of these figures, but they don't think that it's going to gravitate too far away from this right now. And again, it's going to be updated for us. So we'll be able to know. But for production and consumption here, buildings such as textile mills and wheat farms produce and often use various goods. States are limited in what types of resources industries they and industries they support. Uh, pops consume goods to maintain their wealth. And then government buildings like barracks consume goods like ammunition. And we get something like this if you're familiar with Stellaris, right? Where certain buildings or certain specialized buildings produce a uh, maybe it is a certain subset or a certain resource or a certain pop and then those will consume certain things in, in return just like this right pops consume goods to maintain their wealth uh, resources are coming out of specific um, uh, I'm sorry states are limited in what types of resources and industries they support and then government buildings like barracks consume goods and like ammunition so you have this kind of evolving um not even a triangle but like this evolving circle of okay this makes this which consumes this which then will help you make back to the original this so x y and z as it were so it'll probably follow a very similar economic structure to what i assume victoria 2 would be but if, for, for my own reference something that i understand would be stellaris now for infrastructure infrastructure from rivers ports and railways bring the world closer together improving access to goods and movement of people markets are regions in which goods are freely traded one or several countries under a single market owner so talking about infrastructure here with this portion, remember, this is a boon. This is a time when ports are being built across the many empires and colonial empires of the day. Railway booms are huge, right? If you talk, take a look at the transcontinental railroads of the United States, which is a little bit later in this time period, but still. These things are important because this is building the infrastructure that will supply the consumerism that is rampant in the Victorian era. The, to really kind of get status, and status was very important at this time, you had to play into consumerism. You had a parlor, like a foyer. People would enter your home. You're like, look at these ivory tusks from these uh, uh, these elephants that my, my husband, a, a prestigious general, uh, took back from his his travels in the Sudan, like stuff like that. that I, I know it sounds haughty and wordy and over the top. And if you visit any museums with these things, um, it seems gaudy, right? But these were the these were the badges of the time. These were what established you as um, a member of class and infrastructure was support was important to support that. The British Empire could get goods from all over the world because of its infrastructure. Into the pricing portion here, all goods have a market price based on supply and demand. States with poor market access due to underdeveloped infrastructure suffer adverse local prices. Price is everything. Underproduced goods are expensive and make you, make you reliant on imports. Overproduced goods are cheap to buy but unprofitable to make. So you have your economic basis of supply and demand right here. And we, we're going to see this more in the art portion because they actually show a panel of it. But it gives you a breakout of like, hey, if you have no penetration into a market, you can't make money in that market. So 
it will be that typical kind of paradox approach of this seems very complex, but once you crack open how pricing and markets work, I'm sure working your brain around it will be quite quick. You know, states with poor market access, act, market access being key here due to underdeveloped infrastructure, suffer adverse local prices. So if you have no means to transport your goods around to your trade partners or the, to the rest of the outside market, then you cannot get any actual money from it. That's your market access because of that infrastructure we talked about a second ago. So cool to see how that kind of plays into the actual history and not just a quote unquote game mechanic. Now for pop needs, needs can be fulfilled by a variety of goods. After needs are fulfilled, any leftover money builds wealth and standard of living. Improving standard of living leads to increased population growth and turns pops into loyalists. Worsening conditions turn pops into radicals. So current basic food expenses for 7.35K Dixie farmers in Louisiana. Um, you can see it's got grain, fish, meat, fruit, and groceries. And then you get that total cost there. Significant factors affecting the pops standard of living. Average of 40% income taxation level. So clothes is expensive, furniture is expensive, services is expensive. It makes up to 70, 17, 11, and 14% expenditure. I feel like I'm like teaching an economy class looking at something like that. And it kind of makes my brain bleed a, little bit, be, bleed a little bit because I had a graphic design and a theater arts slash improv degree. So you can tell that this is not my strong suit. But it's still going to be just a matter of understanding this in the same way you probably do looking at us. Like I, I keep making Stellaris as a comparison because I feel like there's no good comparison in crusader kings 3 but i feel like it's just going to be a number of a, a simple thing of okay looking at hey my dixie farmers in louisiana might have x expenditure or x drain upon my overall economy i have to make sure that y um, from other locations is replenishing that drain much like you do planet to planet looking at stellaris and its pop needs for all the buildings within it Again, that population growth making loyalists or radicals, depending on the conditions, which is quite cool. Wages. Uh, privately owned buildings have full control over their wages and try to maximize their profits. Uh, countries control government and military wages, which benefit different parts of their society. Government subsidies uh, guarantee a good wage to keep production high. So you've got an average annual wage here, and it shows how it breaks out across your capitalists, your engineers, your machinists, and your laborers. And uh, look at this logging camps in Tennessee, workforce modifiers, yearly productivity, and employees. So 4.5 a year employment. So I, I don't even really understand this. And it's terrifying because it's also exciting. And I think that's kind of one of the big things with a paradox game is like you look at a, a, an abstract menu pulled apart away from the game. You're like, I don't get it. But when you kind of put it in the context of how the game works, it does, of course, start to make sense. Like, obviously, yes, um, the productivity here is 4.5 a year and the average annual wage is 4.26 with weekly taxes of 223. So it'll be really cool to see how privately owned businesses and how that private market or how the private... Um, sector influence this and countries control government and military wages as well and how those kind of play into overall wages now taxes with tax your economy in various ways to make money for the treasury income taxes deducted from wages paid poll taxes per head consumption taxes on goods bought and dividend taxes on profits made who is taxed how much depends on your laws so clearly something that you can influence and from what i've seen it's very similar too as well with um, Stellaris where you have stuff like absolute monarchy and so on and so forth so it'll be cool to see how those government systems come into the game use your trading fleet to import and export goods with allies and rivals alike export goods you have a competitive advantage to manufacture import resources you lack or manufactured goods your people need trade routes can be mutually beneficial or aggressive and there's some hints from the art that kind of maybe gives us a little uh, taste of what trade might look like. We don't really know a whole ton just yet, but I imagine that this is going to be an extremely huge portion of the game, especially when it comes to market access and breaking into markets you do not have immediate access at the start of the game with. Economic system. As one of the many types of laws you can change, the country's economic system drastically changes your play style. 
Imports are penalized under mercantilism. Isolationist countries aim for self-sufficiency and under free trade pop investments are plentiful, but subsidies are limited. So you're gonna be constantly looking at these um, econo the economic system and how you're going to be using this, right? You're, are you gonna be a traditionalist, isolationist, mercantilist, so on and so forth? And how is that going to then influence the type of market you want to grow or break into or like free trade, for example, versus say mercantilism and how that's going to be different, right? Isolationism, right? Countries aim for self-sufficiency. So they're going to probably have a penalty when it comes to foreign markets, but they'll have a benefit in a domestic market, something of the sort. Then conclusion, your economy is not only your country's engine, but also shapes your population. Access to cheap resources and captive markets influence diplomacy. All actions reverberate through the economy, creating new economic and political challenges. So now we've kind of gone over really quickly the Vikonomics here, the Vikonomics, the economics of the game. Let's move over to the art to just quickly get an idea for how uh, Victoria 3 is going to look and play out when we play the game. Now this is when we got not too long ago too. I think it was actually just a day or two ago. And again, you here get the art direction. You get that over the top gaudy look of the Victorian era. And one of the cool things that they were saying during the PDX con is how the art of the UI itself is not meant to be custom from um, nation to nation. They wanted it to kind of be a, a general UI that could fit anyone that is muted for the most part. And any, any faction playing or any nation playing didn't really have to notice a huge change in the UI's general aesthetics. When you look at stuff like Crusader Kings 3 and the flavor pack, the Northern Lords all have uh, very ornate carved um, rune woodwork around their UI. It's different for say a Western European faction or to say a Middle Eastern faction or even a Far Eastern faction or an Indian faction, so on and so forth. So they said they wanted to go with just kind of a neutral UI and you get that right here, right? You get something that is a little bit more neutral. Um, again, this is all early footage, so it could all change, who knows? I personally, when I when I jump to stuff like this, I would like to see, um, this, this picture is not as bad, but when there, there's one on the actual Steam Workshop where it's very cluttered, so I'd like to see a UI that works a little bit more like Crusader Kings 3 in that most of it's all localized to the right side of the screen unless you jump into three or four menus and those clutter the screen, but they're all easily dismissed quickly. So I just hope that, because um, I've looked at screenshots of Victoria 2 and I'm like, good God, what is this? I don't get it. So I hope that Victoria 3 kind of keeps in line with that streamlined UI experience and makes it so that the game is pretty nice and narrow to work with. Again, here's that UI you can see kind of brought to life here. What is this? This is institutions here. So I am excited to understand too, like how all this plays out, right? I thought this said petite baguette. And I was like, well, don't, don't sign me up for that. I'd like a large baguette. Uh, the Catholic Church, Industrialist, Armed Forces, Intelligentsia. So you have got these what seem to be different factions within your nation and how, or probably opposition towards your overall um, uh, nation's governmental type. The Russian market, like I was saying here, here's the infrastructure usage and market access. So with no infrastructure, you've got no market access. So these are the things that are probably going to be very huge in building up your actual um, your GDP or well, your, your actual economy. And this looks to be for this specific region, though, not just overall Russia, right? This is the Russian market market for this region. It's got no infrastructure, so no access to that market. So it's probably going to have a number of penalties that are strapped onto it. You can see all the other things here with the population, it's struggling, impoverished, and secure, what percentage of those things are what, so on and so forth. Now for the ambiance, they were saying that the overall map, they want it to kind of fit in the feel of that era, right? And, and they, they've done that really well when you look at Crusader Kings and how those maps and the, and the overall vibe of that kind of fits in with the era. And they, they said they wanted this to fit in with the paintings of the era of the Victorians. So that is reflected pretty well in these, what look like static clouds, but they're highly stylized artistic clouds, right? Pretty cool, pretty awesome. And this was actually something that one proud Bavarian popped out in his video, was talking about these nodes that he sees 
on the trade routes and he was saying that you know these could probably mean a whole lot when it comes to the trade mechanics of the game again i personally don't know much about the trade mechanics in victoria period um so he had a pretty good idea about that so please go and check his video out on the art he does a really good job of talking about trade in general but ambiance again just to kind of look at more of this you can get an idea for um, each and every location and how it has these probably little buildings in it just like we get with um, the crusader kings 3 how you get expanded portions of these little cities as you're building them up and the cultural differences you get this difference here of course the standard of living the state religion the primary cultures so if this is france this is french um, but that could also be multiple cultures, right? Especially if you're looking at stuff like the British Empire, which is going to have more cultures wrapped into it, some being bigger than, of course, others. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, too, like how these government systems work, right? Like government, absolute monarchy. How will that actually play its hand when it comes to Victoria 3's game mechanics? And for the map itself, it is very indicative of an actual map of the era, too, like I was saying. So you get a very um, late 1800s style, or I guess mid to late 1800s style map. Um, very hand-drawn, even has that, that a nice nautical star there. Um, so very, very cool in its, its aesthetics. All of, just like every other Crusader, or I'm sorry, not Crusader, uh, every other Paradox game, everything's name is very true to the time and true to the individual ruling over it. Like, take a look, another example. I keep saying Crusader Kings 3 because <clears throat> it's the best example I know, but Anytime you take over swaths of territory, the naming conventions fit the culture that rules them. It'll probably be very similar to Victoria 3 here in just more of an expanded way than usual. And again, <clears throat> another shot here of the map. And the last thing I want to talk about real quick is release date. Now, they have not given us any indication of when that release date is. In fact, they said during PDXCon, hey, there's it's too early to talk about release date and if there's still an alpha it's going to be a good amount of time until we get victoria 3 in the wild now if we look though at empire of sin and at crusader kings 3 two games that were relatively recently both announced and released by paradox um, well paradox as the publisher at least uh, for empire of sin romero games is who developed it uh we see about a year in between so Empire of Sin was announced in June of 2019 at E3 2019. And then it was slated to come out the second quarter of 2020, but was actually delayed until December 1st of 2020. And if we look at Crusader Kings 3, that was announced in October of 2019 and came out in September of 2020. So I think it's pretty safe to say that we could probably see Victoria 3 coming out in Q2, the second quarter of 2021, if not possibly being delayed into that um, August, September timeframe, just like uh, Crusader Kings 3 was. I don't think that that's a pretty... I don't think it's an unfair assessment. I think that a year plus or minus a couple months is pretty safe. So hopefully around this time next year, we'll be able to dive into Victoria 3, do some really fun Let's Plays. We'll jump into some guides, all sorts of fun action. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Go ahead and leave me a comment below on what you are most excited about in playing Victoria 3. Or, hey, if you want to give me a tip for playing Victoria 2 on, say, hey, try this nation to start off with. You're going to have a lot of fun. I guarantee it. Um, let me know in the comment section. I'm going to be playing a lot in the next coming months with Victoria 2 to learn a lot more about the um, current systems in the game and how they'll be changing when we come into Victoria 3, hopefully, hopefully in 2021, if not in 2022. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.